fond hope keeps the spark alive, whispering ever that tomorrow things will mend. Villa Julian near Rome, summer AD 19, Emperor ruling Tiberius, chapter 3. A dog barked from far away across the valley. Its voice echoed, fading away into silence. This seemed to be the beginning of the awakening of animals and humans, stirring the household of slaves about their work in preparation for the family rising at Villa Julian. At this early hour, Pomponia slowly roused from semi-consciousness and hazily gazed through half-closed eyes, stretching her limbs under the soft linen coverlets. She became aware of the high vaulted ceilings, fine rays of sunlight filtering through the chinks in the wooden shutters. A hoopoe with its familiar double cry called outside, then another in reply. The events of the previous days stirred young Pomponia. She felt compassion for the young Ethiopian prince, the loss of his homeland, his family, and now the cubs born to his precious panther. Late into the night, Pomponia had written her account of all the events that had taken place with the animal collectors. She had described in detail their faces, their clothing, their words, and unspoken attitudes, expressions and gestures. Thoughts flowed from the pictures in her mind, and as she wrote, her anxiety quelled. She thought of her promise to Hannah. She would be silent about the boy and the cats. She was going to enjoy this summer at Villa Julian, enjoy being a young girl with freedoms that were still hers because of her youth. The travellers had packed up their carts and animals and within two days they were gone. A few days passed by, the great upheaval and excitement quietened down, it was as if a dream that had come to life impacted on their lives then upon awakening that had seemed so vivid was now past and unreal. Pompernia stirred again, raising herself onto her elbow. She called out, Hannah, where are you? Hannah had been awake since daybreak and had already collected the water in a small pitcher for Pompernia to wash with. She'd been waiting in the adjoining room and he immediately responded, I'm here, mistress. I have your water for washing. Hannah gently placed the sponge into the water and wiped Pompernia's face and body and wrapped her in a soft linen towel. Hannah, there's so much to do today. Oh, I feel the need to explore. You will accompany me to the higher ground around the perimeter of the villa. I need to see how the sweet chestnut trees that were planted when I was younger have grown. Also the oak woods. I heard a hoopoe this morning. Maybe there'll be chicks. Oh, and I want to make a garland of rosemary from the wild bushes growing over in the valley. Oh, there's so much to revisit from last summer. The grounds will be dry and thorny in places, so we must both wear our leather sandals. There will be a lot of walking to do, but our clothing must be loose and enable us to move swiftly and freely among the rocks and crevices. Pomponia sighed whilst closing her eyes as her lips broke into a broadened smile. She burst out, clapping her hands together. Oh, how I've longed for the freedoms of Villa Julian and its oh, unencumbered ways. She jumped up as the linen towel dropped to the floor. Excitedly, she exclaimed, you take a basket of fruit with us and bring my tablet and I'll carry my stylus here in my purse. Hannah smiled at her young mistress's exuberance and noted that this excited young lady was blossoming into a woman. Soon her simple tunic and belts would need to be extended with suitable undergarments, as was the custom in Roman aristocratic families. Hannah placed Pomponia's tunic over her shoulders. She arranged the wide woolen belt around Pomponia's slim waist and the pallor, the long loose wrap over her shoulders. Pomponia protested that it wasn't necessary to dress so formally out here in the country. Hannah, although, was aware of her young mistress's press princess, but she also knew of the mistress of the villa's view about young ladies of elite families and their decorum when venturing out into the countryside. Pomponia ate a simple breakfast, a 
of round pancakes and honey. She gathered her few writing aids and beckoned Hannah to depart with her through the courtyard pool gardens where lively colourful passerine birds strutted and pecked at the grey dead stone of the statues of Greek and Roman goddesses. Quickly Pomponia swept past these lifeless bodies. She felt a lightness of spirit. It filled her inner self as she stepped through the iron gate leading to the valley which stretched out ahead of them. The land dropped away in a southerly direction and where the sheep had pastured, the grassy areas were cropped low. As they walked, it added a spring to their steps. Pompeia skipped and ran down the hill towards the home oak woods, brushing past bushes of golden broom, wild thyme and rosemary shrubs. Pompeia paused for a brief moment to snatch at the pungent scented foliage. Happy to carry the fronds with her on her descent, holding the woody stems to her nose to breathe in the very essence of summer. As she scurried down the narrow pathway, the bees swarmed around the sweet yellow pods of the broom and flowering acacia trees. Her gaze rested on the sweet chestnut trees. This year, for the first time, they were burgeoning with long yellow upright catkins which gave a dusky, misty appearance, boding well for the autumn harvest and the sweet shiny red fruits to come. The sheep had not pastured these narrower paths, so the long grass swept high over her bare legs. They continued on, wandering through the cool shade of the woods across streams and over last year's fallen dead trees. The landscape altered slightly, and after leaving the dense woods, it rose to higher ground. They climbed slowly among the rocks following the dry parched path, antip anticipating cleanly the summit of Collis Albi and the delights of the source of the many streams still nourished by the waters of the lake of Juturna. This was the place Pomponia could rest, knowing she could open up her tablet and be undisturbed. It was her childhood secret place. Many hours had been spent there swimming in the lake's cooling waters. No need to fear of discovery or chastisement, just freedom and the time to meander along with her thoughts and reflections. To her, this was sheer luxury. There, concealed behind the rocky outcrop and under the shade of olive tree, she took out her tablet and proceeded to write her thoughts into words and meaningful, humorous anecdotes. Meanwhile, Hannah stayed at a short distance, herself appreciating these periods of quiet and solitude. Hannah surveyed the beauty of the surroundings and closed her eyes in silent, thankful prayer to the God of her forefathers, along with her heartfelt request for guidance. Her life as a Hebrew slave girl had been favourable, she had been sold into the household of a fair and good master. Her young mistress was kindly and always shared with her extra food and clothing when it was needed. She felt a deep sense of sorrow for her sisters, who were still in slavery in Rome and had been reduced to hard domestic labours by heavy taskmasters. Her heart felt weighed down with despair for them. She knew very little of the outcome of their fate apart from recent scandalous gossip among the traders to the kitchens at Domus Regoria whilst in Rome. Hannah longed to know what had become of them after their purchase. Dwelling on these thoughts caused her face to become downcast and brought a deep sigh. This did not go unnoticed by Pomponia, whose sense of hearing and perception always seemed to increase with time spent at Villa Julian. Hannah, you sigh so deeply, what troubles you? Come, we are amidst this array of calm and beauty. What could disturb you? Your eyes. You look down and I see tears on your lashes. Are you unhappy in our household? Has anyone mistreated you? Tell me now. If it's within my power to right any wrongs, I will act on your behalf. Young mistress, I am happy in this household. What distresses me is not within my power or, sadly, that of yours to deal with. Hannah hesitated and lowered her gaze. Pomponia rose and walked across to Hannah. She laid a hand on Hannah's shoulder. 
I will one day be mistress of my own household and you will be with me wherever I go. You have faithfully and loyally looked after me from my earliest memories as a baby. You've been my confidant from those tender years. I now am moving toward my adulthood. Today we're here in this place of secret. Speak to me openly as a young woman with concerns that could be shared. Trust me, Hannah, please don't be frightened. Hannah looked up into the eyes of another young woman's earnest, innocent face. She started haltingly to recount to Pomponia the circumstances of her family. They had all been taken from Caesarea when her father had been killed. Her mother and the two twin baby girls had been sold together. She had never known of their fate or whereabouts, having not seen or heard of any of them for the past 10 years. Only recently, just before the household had departed to Villa Julian, she heard gossip and rumours amongst the tradespeople that had visited the kitchens in Rome. Her sisters were in difficult circumstances. She was distressed by the contrast of her life and the possible tragedy of her sisters being harshly mistreated. Pompeia listened with compassion and tender feeling. Throughout her own life, she'd always been able to turn to her father never for a moment doubting or hesitating that he would always help. Her knowledge of injustice and treatment had been limited and meagre. However, she was not totally unaware of injustice because of some of the innuendos and behind the hand chatter she'd encountered from her many malicious cousins. Here in front of her was this orphan, bereft of all family and without hope of justice or even knowledge of the whereabouts of any surviving members related to her. Pomponia paced up and down, thinking wildly to herself of how she could be of assistance to her loyal slave girl. A great shifting of attitude and realisation slowly came to her. She would soon have jurisdiction over her own household of slaves and their lives would be under control. She had to know of their circumstances, their background. She would then be an influential woman of Rome, albeit with no public spoken voice, and maybe always hidden behind her closed carriage in public. However, influence and power could be one of her secret actions. With her, stylish, she could record their lives, concerns, and then seek justice with information she gathered. As her thoughts raced ahead, she formulated a plan Hannah, whilst we are here at the villa, we are far from Rome and news will be hard to come by. If we were to hear of their circumstances, it would be impossible to help your sisters. We must therefore wait in patience until our return to Rome in two months' time. Then we will plan to get news. I know we can trust our tutor Andraticus, who teaches in many households, He may be able to find information as to their whereabouts. And my my cousin Julia Livia will visit us here next week. I'm sure she can be trusted. She might be able to assist. Meanwhile, we mustn't speak of this anymore in public, but maybe only here, out in this quiet place, can we be sure we will not be overheard. Our voices must be silent or words spoken in an undertone on this matter. But never must you give up hope of having knowledge of a good outcome. Come, now, I will write on my tablets in two columns. One, without names or specific references, what you've related. And the second column will be our possible solutions and course of action. Hannah's eyes changed. She felt no longer distressed. She was filled with hope and the deepest respect for her young mistress. The following days at Villa Julian passed with an indolent, peaceful repetition. The mornings were spent walking and gathering wild flowers. Hannah and Pomponia heading to their secret place, high in the hills, the Lake of Juturna. They bathed and rested, always finding time for Pomponia to write her record of information that would be needed upon their return to Rome. In the afternoons, Pomponia rested. And in the evenings, the family gathered for games and eating in the beautiful gardens surrounding the family pool. 
During one of these evenings, the slaves of the household came through to Gaius and informed him that a visitor from Rome, Aulus Platius Silvanus, had arrived and wished to speak with him. Gaius, along with Quintus, immediately went to welcome their guest. Asinia and Pomponia were on the other side of the garden, seated amongst the arbour of jasmine and wisteria. The air was heavy with this mixture of scents. The night owls hooted overhead, and a gentle breeze lifted the petals of the wisteria. Gaius brought Aulus over to be seated in the arbour near Asinia and Pomponia. The slaves brought bowls of water for refreshment, along with wine, sweet cakes, and a large selection of fresh fruit from the family farm. Pears and early strawberries were in abundance that year, and also apples from the orchard. The family talked and laughed and inquired to Alice's health and employment in Rome. Quintus was eager to hear of the delights of the Circus Maximus and the entertainment enjoyed there. Alice promised to take him when the family returned to Rome in the autumn. During the course of the evening, Alice approached Pomponia and asked if she was in good health now after her carriage fall. Pomponia said with an open smile on her face, oh, I thank you so much for your concern and also your swift action. You saved me from a great accident, but no lasting damage. I've been spending my time here walking and climbing through the many paths surrounding Villa Julian. There's such a variety of activities to occupy us. I like to collect the sweet rosemary that grows wild and prolific. It is invigorating. So I feel very strong and healthy now. Alice replied, ah, the Albanus Mons. I've always been, it's always been a favourite of my family. When I was a youth, we visited frequently to our Villa Remus near to Lake Nemai. I spent many enjoyable hours swimming and fishing the lake there. It's got a marvellous vantage point to observe the soaring kestrels and cormorants that nest and breed there. In my leisure years of youth, I used to watch them and then I'd try and sketch their movements as they swooped and rose seemingly without effort. Pomponia was watching his face as he became animated and enthused about his interest in these beautiful birds. She too was a keen observer of the natural world and also enjoyed trying to put what she saw onto her tablet and papyrus scrolls. They continued their discussions of mutually shared interests and both laughed at their own efforts and the mistakes they'd made. The atmosphere that evening was relaxed and jovial. As the moon rose and the great bright stars rose also high in that summer sky. Alice accepted the offer of hospitality from Gaius to stay over with them as their guest. The next morning, Pomponia rose early, just as the cockerels were crowing. She had with her inks and scrolls packed tightly in her purse. She slipped silently out of the villa even before Hannah was aware that she'd stirred. She wore her simple tunic and as the morning air was still and the sun had not yet warmed away the dew from the pasture, she wore her pallor loosely over her shoulders and tied around her waist. The steps were sure-footed and accustomed to the path now. The need to stop for the flowers and views was not her aim today. Therefore, the steep climb up to Lake Juturna was swift. As she reached the crag at the summit, the view to the east caught her breath. The horizon was ablaze with a fiery coral and scarlet red streaks. As she watched with her hand shielding her eyes, the dark azure of the sky changed every second from a deepest, darkest ink blue to palest grey and mauve. The great orb of the sun appeared over the horizon. The red surrounding it switched to lighter and brighter yellow and the undulating landscape below took on the hues of golden papyrus. Long shadows from the vines growing in rows in the valley looked like a marching army crested with golden helmets glistening under the intense sun their strict lines appearing to sway as the sun rose. Pomponi just sat amidst the moment. It passed so rapidly. How she longed to capture all this on her scrolls or to remember and ingrain its memory in her mind. 
She knows she could write and describe the sequence. Her words flowed from her reed pen, her ink rapid and indelible onto the papyrus scroll. Time passed by and the sun rose. Pompeia realised she'd been writing for some time and the cool waters of the lake drew her eyes. Stretching, she untied her pala and slipped her tunic to the ground, her sandals she discarded by the edge of the tall reeds. As she stepped between the grasses, a pair of great crested grebes rose from the lake, performing a familiar courtship dance, rising vertically out of the waters, their heads shaking. They made a familiar chuckling sound as their ruffles of feathers fanned out. Pompeia's slim body slipped into the lake and she sank beneath the still crystal waters. She could now hold her breath for some time and the joy she had of swimming underwater gave her a freedom that only a need for air hampered. Being aware of the time and knowing she would be missed very shortly, Pompeia reluctantly swam back towards the bank and rising out of the water she parted the reeds and crept towards her tunic. She sat for a few moments to allow the sun to dry the droplets of water from her refreshed skin before placing her tunic over her head. As she reached for her pallor, the familiar call of the female mallard rising and falling and the soft shrill whistles of her chicks made her part the reeds to see what all the disturbance was about. There, on the other side of the lake, was Quintus and his new friend Aulus diving and splashing around. Pompeia watched for a few moments and joined in their excitement as they acted the clowns. Suddenly she gasped, realising that only a moment earlier she would have been discovered. She too had enjoyed the private secluded time alone before they had arrived. As she collected her writing equipment, she forgot to pick up her pala and it was not until she'd reached the pasture ground near to the villa she remembered. Hoping that no one would see her silent passage into the villa, she crept through the passageways and followed the stairway the slaves took to the upper rooms and down the corridor to her bedroom. At that moment, she heard the familiar footsteps of Hannah, who said with a faint knowing smile on her face, Mistress, I have been searching for you. You didn't wake me to attend to you. Uh, maybe you were engaged in the kitchen garden, searching for herbs and flowers? Please, tell me in future if this is going to happen again. Then there will be no need to alert the mistress of the villa. Hannah fixed a knowing look upon Pomponia, who replied, Oh, Hannah, you do fuss so, but please don't say anything this time. Um, the kitchen gardens are so inviting as the sun rises. Uh, the dawn light this morning it was glorious and I've captured it as best I can with words on my scroll. I did not know that the horizon was so evident from the low aspect of the walled kitchen garden mistress. The next time you go off wandering on your own I will come with you to higher ground and then you can enjoy the lake and surroundings and I can safely guard your belongings and know you are safe whilst you swim. She had been found out. She had acted indiscreetly swimming alone. And remembering seeing her brother too, what a close thing that no one else had discovered her. She was sorry and reassured Hannah she would not go out alone again on any more early morning escapades. Pomponia was ravenous for breakfast. She found a pale blue pallet to wear over her shoulders and tied her woolen belt around a different new white tunic. The first meal of the day was always relaxed and everyone ate where they wished and at a time they chose. Pomponia asked that she may eat her breakfast in the wisteria arbour. The household slaves carried her fruit and hot pancakes along with fresh used milk in a wooden pitcher. To her surprise, her father and Alice were already taking their food also in the arbour. They both welcomed her to join them. She sat quietly eating, thinking and hoping no one would notice the flushed appearance to her cheeks and the way her wet hair had dried into an untidy, straggly, limp mass. 
Her father was too engrossed in his meal. Only Alice looked briefly across and caught her eyes for a brief second. There was a mischievous smile in his bright eyes. Pompania felt the colour rise to her already flushed cheeks. She became very involved with the honey and pancakes, eating rather more than normal. Her father approved of a hearty appetite and went in search of the slaves to replenish the tray of cakes. Pomponi was a growing lady and he looked with favour upon his only daughter. At this moment, Alice moved slightly away from Pomponia, realising she was feeling a little uncomfortable and not wishing to embarrass her. Your brother Quintus took me for an early morning swim today. It was most refreshing. I remember you told me yesterday you also like to visit the many paths around here. Maybe whilst out some time you lost this pala? I found it on one of the rocks. I remember seeing you with it when you were in the carriage travelling here. He smiled and his eyes laughed as he held out the pala neatly folded, along with a frond of rosemary nestled in the folds. Pompani was at a loss to know what to say. For just a few moments, her natural confidence and resolve returned swiftly as her mind raced and her tongue found the right words to say, oh, oh yes, it possibly is mine. Oh, I've got so many, I may have lost it some days ago. Thank you. She instinctively lifted the rosemary to her lips as she moved the fragrant needle-like leaves between her fingers and inhaled. Alice quietly spoke. I remember you said you liked to collect the wild rosemary. How it grows so well here. It emits a sweet odour with a delicate pale flower. Alice paused, then in a soft voice said almost to himself, many of the brides of Rome wear it in their hair as a symbol of love and fidelity. Pompeni dropped her eyes and longed for her father to return. To her relief, he arrived at this moment with a house slave carrying another platter of pancakes. Pomponia's appetite had vanished and it was at this moment she fled making a mumbled excuse, taking her precious ro rosemary and pallor with her. Later that day, Alice took his leave of the family. He explained he had to return to Rome and would be engaged in a campaign for two years in Pannonia. He was given a warm handshake from Gaius and seemed to have made lifelong friends of Quintus and Lucius. Pomponia waited alongside her mother as he left. And upon mounting his horse, he turned and raised his right hand towards the family. The following morning, Gaius and Asinia called Pomponia to their private rooms. Gaius explained that her brothers were now taking on new lives after they all returned to Rome in September. So too, she was entering her young womanhood, now being 16 years of age. He told her that Alias Platius Silvanus had asked for her hand in marriage. If it was all agreed, they would be betrothed for two years, and on his return from Pannonia, their marriage would be arranged. As parents, they found this match good. The two families were well connected through noble lines, and she would be well cared for with a house in Rome and a villa very close by to Villa Julian. Did she find this agreeable? Was he a man that she could be loyal to and faithfully carry out wifely duties and then grow to love? Pomponia stood before her parents and said, I know that as a daughter it is my duty to marry soon and please my family. I do hope that the man I marry may be honest and fair. He may love me like my dear father you have done the day I can remember. But how can I know what is best for me? I have no experience in these matters. Alice and I have spoken a little together and we laugh together. We have interests of a similar nature. He looks like a man I could learn to love if he's fair, honest and just. But I am happy, father, if you and mother are happy. My dear father, I entrust my happiness in the judgment of who I marry to you and mother. You are a good and trusting daughter. We will arrange all necessary inquiries. Then if all legalities and facts have been established satisfactorily, you will be betrothed to Alice. When it is done, I will send word to Alice that our family will join you together in two years and two months from today. 
Alwivus wished you to have these gifts as a token of his fidelity and future love. Gaius handed Pomponia a golden casket, which contained a gold necklace and bracelet of exquisite pearls. There was a ring set with a large, dark green emerald and an amethyst necklace. She said she would keep them safe in her room until all the formalities had been finished. And if all the legal matters were satisfactory, she would happily wear the jewellery. Pompania left her parents with lots of thoughts flitting around in her mind and of course found her writing tablet to record all the details of the last few days. She smiled to herself as she thought of all that had happened and felt a very slight cascade of bubbles ripple through her stomach. A very strange feeling. She'd never experienced it before. She wrote down all the questions she wanted to ask Aulus, all about his childhood, his family, his education, the scholars he read, who were his friends, what were his goals in life, what were his views on justice, how did he treat his slaves and sisters and his mother. So many questions raced along onto her scrolls, which she carefully concealed in her chest, along with her other plans to investigate the whereabouts of Hannah's family. Julia Livia's arrival came with much whoops of joy for Pomponia. This was a most exciting time to Pomponia. Julia was her dearest friend. She also was nearly 16 years of age. Recently betrothed to Nero Caesar, her cousin, the son of Germanicus, she was cared for in the household of grandfather Emperor Tiberius. Pomponia and Julia had grown up confiding in each other all their secrets. The door to their room was shut tightly. Looking cautiously around, Julia sat closely by Pomponia in a low tone related scandals and injustices that were being tolerated with, within Roman society. She heard women talking in the corridors of the palace. Julia's furrowed brows contracted, her delicate face contorted, Lowering her head, she whispered her fears into Pomponia's ear. Her own mother, Livilla, kept disappearing for days on end. Julia did not know where she went. When she returned, her rage was vent on anyone nearby. All she seemed to do was constantly rant about her own brother and sister. She hated them. Julia raised her tear-filled eyes. There was more to follow. Pomponia, wide-eyed and shocked, listened in silence. Julia had heard the cries of slave women having their children wrenched away to be brought up by families who needed more labour. Daughters of her relatives were married to men they barely knew. They were married, sent to their husbands, and sometimes no word was heard of them again. What had become of these young brides? The women of Rome spoke of these matters, but only in secrecy and whispered in corridors. The pain of these women was not heard. They had no rights to record these matters. Men read, orated, recited and wrote their account of life from their standpoint only. A man's word was law in his household. Pomponia and Julia spoke quietly of these matters and each night, Pomponia recorded everything, concealing them in her precious writing chess. Towards the end of the week that cousin Julia was staying with the family, grandmother Vipsania came to visit. She was a stately woman of 55 years, two husbands and seven births along with the death of two ba babies had taken its toll on the weak heart of Vipsania. She arrived to stay for the remainder of their time at Villa Julian. Away from the heat of Rome, she rested in the cool atrium gardens, lounging on couches covered with soft furs, attended by two Egyptian slave men who fanned her with large ostrich feathers. The richness of her purple silks intensified the deep purple of her lips and the, day, the deathly pallor of her complexion. 
At first she barely spoke, each word producing a raspy, brittle cough. She was given concoctions of garlic drinks and strong smelling herbs. Whether it was the drinks or her being able to completely rest with very little exertion, no one really knew. But gradually her skin became lighter and her lips returned to a more natural colour, as long as she was not overly excited or stressed. Pompeia and Julia spent the afternoons reading poetry to their grandmother. Celine sat in the sun, her slim arms moving rhythmically over the strings of the lyre. Her snake's headed golden bangles glistened as she sang beautifully the lyrical poetry of Sappho. This soothed Vipsania, and although she did not understand Greek, she would drift off to sleep while listening to the music and singing. These afternoons were pleasant times for Julia and Pomponia, for not only did they read to Vipsania, but she would also recount to them stories of her life, which had been sad and eventful. They learned of her first love for Tiberius and of her marriage that had been forcibly ended by Augustus while she was pregnant with her second child. That child died. She remembered wistfully how Tiberius had never stopped loving her, even though he'd been forced to marry another woman. They had met up many years later, and with tears in her eyes, she spoke of his gazing upon her longingly. The son they had together, Drusus Julius Caesar, was her pride and joy, as was her dear granddaughter, Julia. Vipsania never ceased to mention all his military achievements and consulship. He'd ruled with Gaius Norbanus Flaccus just two years previously. Drusus was now governor of Illyricum. She was extremely proud of her favourite son and would constantly ask for news of him. The girls soothed her unsettled mind and body as best they could. This would be their last summer together as a family with Quintus and Lucius. So their father Gaius spared no expense or extravagance in the provision of sport and entertainment for them all. He also had good news from his inquiries about the arrangement for Pomponia's betrothal. This was all of a positive nature. Aulus, however, was committed to his campaign in Pannonia, where constant attack by large barbarian tribes meant the building of fortresses on the banks of the Danube. Hence, the wedding was set for two years' time. By Roman standards, Pomponia would be mature to take on the responsibilities of marriage and her own household. Pomponia wondered how her life would alter when she married taking little account of the immense changes the very near future would hold. <laughs>